Hello and welcome to this Baja 4 Collaborative Worship Service. I'm Jamili Omar, the Director of Lifespan Faith Development at the UU Church of Tucson, and I welcome you here today. Whenever you are joining us, wherever you are worshiping from, you are welcome to bring your whole self here. We are the Baja 4, representing the Unitarian Universalists across southeastern Arizona, as Unitarian Universalists, we love beyond belief and find inspiration from a wide variety of spiritual, religious, and secular sources. We come together as the Baja Four because we know we are stronger together. We represent Borderlands Unitarian Universalists Cinemato, Sky Island Unitarian Universalist Church in Sierra Vista, Mountain Vista Unitarian Universalist Church in Northwest Tucson, and my home congregation, the Unitarian Universal Church of Tucson on the east side of Tucson. In today's service, we're reflecting on the ways we learn and teach this really slippery thing that we call spirituality. It's a concept that I, frankly, have always been a little afraid of. It means lots and lots of things and sometimes not much. And we're going to explore that today. As we start today, I invite you to think of your own experience with the concept of spirituality and your feelings about it. If it brings up strong feelings, I invite you to sit with them with your childlike curiosity. Where do those feelings come from? What do they bring up for you? If it means not much to you at all, I invite you to sit with that too. What does the concept mean to you and how do you experience it? What do you attach to that word, spirituality? UU Minister Reverend Nancy Schaefer penned our chalice-lighting words today, and to me, they embody the tension that we experience in the term spirituality, and they also invite us to approach the word with curiosity and wonder. I personally believe that Unitarian Universalism is a faith that can hold all, which is the title of her poem. And it does so when we allow each person to bring their experience with them. She says, that which holds all. 
Because she wanted everyone to feel included in her prayer, she said right at the beginning several names for the holy. Spirit, she said, Holy One, Mystery, God. Then, thinking these weren't enough ways of addressing that which cannot fully be addressed, she added peculiarities like Spirit of Life, Spirit of Love, Ancient Holy One, Mystery We Will Never Fully Know, Gracious God, and also Spirit of This Earth, God of Sarah, Gaia, Thou. And then, tongue loosened, she fell to naming superlatives as well. Most creative one, greatest source, closest hope. Even those superlatives for the sacred seemed to her probably redundant. She couldn't stop. One who made the stars, she said, although she knew technically a number of those present didn't believe that anyone had made the stars, but just luckily it happened. One who is an entire ocean of compassion, she said, no one laughed. That which has been present since before the beginning, she said, and the room was silent. Then, although she hadn't imagined it this way, others began to offer names. Peace, said one. One my mother knew, said another. Ancestor, said a third. Wind, rain, breath, said one near the back. Refuge, that which holds all a child said, water. Someone said, Kyan Yin, and then, womb, witnessed, great kindness, great eagle, eternal stillness. And then, and then, there wasn't any need to say the things she thought would be important to say. And everyone sat hushed until someone said, Amen. In your names, in the spirit of childlike wonder and curiosity, we light our chalice. So that we may listen and grow and learn together. Here's what I'll share with my daughter about why we practice a weekly land acknowledgement. I will say to her that wherever you are, you are on land and in a place with a story. And wherever there is land, there is a longer story of the people and beings on that land. And we believe that we should remember the stories and recognize these people and beings out loud. I will say that it is important to remember these stories and to ask questions about these stories so that you might take action on these stories and that sometimes people work really hard to erase stories that are painful or to erase stories where their own people caused pain to other people, but that we believe in paying attention to what has been hurt and that we believe in being part of the long story of making things better together, especially when we have caused pain. I will say that these words alone are not enough. And that healing and making things better happens in steps and friendships. And sometimes the steps are clear and sometimes they are not. And that friendships take time. But we believe in taking the next step in community, even when that step is just one of many. That we can't skip taking a step just because that step alone is not enough. That we must begin from somewhere and that we must bring our people with us. And I will say to her that when you were born in Southern Arizona, you were born on and near the lands of the people who were the Otham, Opata, Pascuayaki, and Chiricahua Apache. 
and that the land that these people call home was taken many times by many people in violent ways. And that when you were born, it was still being taken by your government. And that these people are unique people with unique cultures, experiences, and survival stories. And that they're still alive, and they're your neighbor. And that you were born into a spiritual community that had work to do to make things better again. And that we say this each week together as one small step. Each night a child is born is a holy night. A time for singing, a time for wondering, a time for worshiping. Each night a child is born. For so the children come, and so they have been coming, always the same way they come, born of the seed of two hearts. No angels herald their beginnings, no prophets predict their future courses, no wise ones see a star to show where to find the babe that will save humankind. Each night a child is born is a holy night. Parents sitting beside their children's cribs feel glory in the sight of new life beginning. They ask, where and how will this new life end? Or will it ever end? Each night a child is born is a holy night. A time for singing. A time for wondering, a time for worshipping. Family. Perhaps to some of us it feels like an easy or familiar word. But what do we mean by family? We know that not all families are shaped by marriage or blood lineage. Not all families live together. Not all families like each other all the time. We know that actually every family inhabits that word differently and breathes life into it through their own unique relationships. And what about church family? Who is our church family? These are the people who we might not invite over for holiday dinner, but we do look forward to seeing them most Sundays. These are the people whose children we get to watch grow up, whether we are active in the process or observers. 
These are the people who we didn't realize would notice when we stop going to church, but they do. And perhaps they even call to say hello. There are many kinds of family. Perhaps you are quarantining with children and palpably aware of the daily spiritual growth through the work of family. Maybe you have been distanced, maybe you have been having distanced visits with beloved children throughout the past year. Or perhaps you don't have any particular youth in mind, but when you think of your church family, there might be children there. This is a prayer for the sacred work of all the many forms of family. O oh, mystery, I pray into your depths for the wisdom you offer to each of us. We as a community are engaged in the work of becoming, each one of us becoming more ourselves. We are all learners. We are children and adults. We are young and old. We are excited and exhausted. We adults each have a different experience of being near to or far from the children in our lives. This is especially true in this past year of quarantine. Some of us have been full-time parents with little company aside from our children. Others of us have been unable to be with the children we adore. We are each coming from a different perspective. Oh mystery, please help us to all ask for what we need, honoring that we will all have different needs. Help us to practice patience in the process of reintegration when we can gather in person again. Please help us learn that we each have something to teach, but help us to remember that we will all always be learning. Please help us to offer our sacred truth to each other and especially to the children in our lives. Knowing that when we plant a seed in the mystery of another person, we cannot predict what will grow. Hello friends, today I'll be reading the story called The Donkey. Many years ago, there lived a man and his donkey. They had farmed together, plowed fields and harvested grain together, gone to the markets together, and had eventually grown old together. The old farmer also had a grandchild who was more than the joy of his life. He knew that he was nearing the end of his days and he wanted to leave the child a little something besides the tiny patch of land that he farmed every day. The only other thing of value that he owned was his donkey. So he decided to sell it at the market and give the money to his grandchild. One morning, as the old man was getting ready to go to the market, he called to his grandchild and asked if they'd like to come along. The child was more than happy to spend time with his cherished grandfather, especially on market day. I'm selling my donkey, said the old man. 
I'm too old to farm and have nothing to bring to market, so I really don't need him. I know he's almost as old as I am, but I think he has a few good years on him and he might fetch a fair price. Since we are trying to sell the old boy, let's not ride him. It's a hot day and he'll look much better at the market if he hasn't been carrying our weight. We'll walk and talk at his side. So they started walking down the road next to the donkey. But as they walked, they passed some farmers working in their fields. The farmers looked up and saw the old man and the child and shook their heads sadly. That old man must be very mean. Here it is a hot day and he's making that poor child walk instead of letting him ride the donkey. When the old man heard this, he stopped and put the child on the donkey's back. Feeling much better for his deed, he walked alongside. After they traveled for a little while more, they passed some men digging a well on the other roadside. Look at that lazy child walking the donkey while that poor old grandfather has to walk on such a hot day. Today's youth has no respect for their elders. When the old man heard these words, he stopped and took his beloved off the donkey and got on it himself. The trio walked on for more than a few miles this way until they met some people coming back from market. Look at that old man, they murmured, riding in luxury on the back of that donkey while the poor little child walks beside him. There's no love there, I can tell you. When he heard this, the old man told the child to get behind him and they rode into the village. Once they had reached the marketplace, the two patiently waited alongside several carts. Some of the vendors in the market looked at the pair scornfully. On a hot day like today, can you imagine the two of them riding that old donkey? The poor beast looks as if it might collapse under their weight. What's wrong with the two good legs God gave them to walk on? Several of the vendors teased and berated the old man for making the donkey carry such a heavy load in the heat of the midday sun. Soon the two of them got off the donkey and the jeers and the complaints stopped. The old man turned to the child and asked, Well, my dear, what lesson have you learned from all of this today? Looking up, the child listened as his grandfather said, When you try to please everyone, you end up pleasing no one. No matter what you do, someone will think you should have done it otherwise. When you have to make a decision, child, make sure you don't think of how it will please this person or that person. Always do what you think is right, and it will always be best. Slowly, the two of them turned around and walked home, the donkey walking beside them. As the story goes, the child learned this lesson well. They say they grow up to be strong-minded and to always follow their spiritual compass. So I want to ask your opinion. When I was re researching that story, The Donkey, there's some debate as to whether the grandfather was actually going intending to sell the donkey at the market. Was he just trying to teach a lesson to the child? Or was he actually planning to sell the donkey and then decided not to? What do you think? And how do we think that the child learned the lesson to follow their compass, their spiritual compass that tells them where to go and not to listen to the vicissitudes of the crowds as they're walking through? There's a song that keeps coming to mind as I was thinking about this service today. Uh, it's Casey Musgrove. Some of you probably know her. The song is called Follow Your Arrow, which is where we got the title from today. And one of the lyrics, sing along if you know this, uh, in the middle of the song, she sa sings, follow your arrow wherever it points. Say what you think, love who you love, because you only get so many trips around the sun. Yeah, you only, only live once, so make lots of noise. I kind of love this song. Um, and the wisdom from both the donkey and from Casey Musgraves isn't just that we should throw all the rules to the wind. There are some rules or some ways of being that actually are in a line with who we are and how we want to live in this world. The trick is to know what those are and how to access them. The trick is to follow our own inner spiritual compass. 
And on this point, science would readily agree. There's a book called The Spiritual Child. Dr. Lisa Miller is the author, and she shares her most compelling research on the intersections between psychology and spirituality. See, she went looking for that question, what does psychology say about spirituality? And surprisingly enough, there wasn't much research. So she started doing it. She did her own experiments and she aggregated other research from other uh, researchers. And um, they came up with a definition of spirituality I want to read to you here. For psychologists, spirituality is, quote, an inner sense of a relationship to a higher power that is loving and guiding. The word we give to this higher power might be God, nature, spirit, the universe, the creator, or other words that represent a divine presence. But the important point is that spirituality encompasses our relationship and dialogue with this higher presence. So let's sit with that for a moment. Spirituality is an inner sense of a relationship to a higher power that is loving and guiding. We live out this relationship through our values. Miller says, the precise embodiment of that transcendent universe the other side of the two-way spiritual conversation comes in many forms and has many different names. She says it can take the form of spirit, the natural world, God, or a sense of oneness with the world, the larger community of which we are part. This two-way spiritual dialogue may or may not include religion. The connection can occur in meditation, in yoga, or something as simple as a child's relationship to a family pet, backyard wildlife, or a beloved tree. So as we see when we get into the definition of spirituality as proposed by psychologists, it's not about religion. It's not as narrow as God. It is big and encompassing and transcendent. And it can be that arrow that helps us know where to go and when. She goes on to say that this definition is critically important because it po posits that a higher power that can be known to us, not only as God, but all these other terms, and that this power is loving, not controlling, hostile, or even just simply disinterested. This higher power loves us and more guides us. We are in a two-way relationship with this higher power. If we also rely on or love it, him, her, them, however we name them, and if we allow ourselves to be guided in return. So when we think about spiritual development and spiritual growth, in particular, I want to talk about our younger friends today. When we think about spiritual development, it is the growth and progression of our inborn spirituality. And Dr. Miller, Miller absolutely believes that we have this capacity inborn within us to create connection that extends beyond ourselves and deeply within ourselves. So spiritual development is the growth and progression of our inborn spirituality as one of our many perceptual and intellectual faculties, including skills from taste and touch to critical thinking. Spiritual development is the changing expression of this natural asset over time as new words, new explanatory models, and new ideas, whether theological, scientific, or family views, allow us to feel or not feel part of something larger and experience an interactive two-way relationship with a guiding and ultimately loving universe. Spirituality is both within religions and not. It is certainly not about religion. Non-religious people and those from religions across the world report similar experiences no matter what they call the divine or the transcendent. And not all people who identify as religious experience a transcendent that is loving and guiding. Miller argues that the spiritual life is innate and it's available, in varying degrees, of course, to each of us. And so where does the spirituality come from? Miller writes, 
Natural spirituality is a direct sense of listening to the heartbeat of the living universe, of being at one with that seen and unseen world, open at an ease in that connection. Each child's spirituality precedes and transcends, transcends language, culture, and religion. It comes as naturally to children as their fascination with the butterfly or the twinkling star-filled night sky. As parents and guardians and church family, we play a powerful role in our child's spiritual development, just as we play a powerful role in every other aspect of their development. Miller argues that spirituality is natural and inborn fundamental to the human constitution. The piece of the research that's particularly hard for me to get my head around is the power that she ascribes to this definition of spirituality. And I'm sure there's some of you listening thinking, yeah, I have that difficulty too. Stay with me for a minute. She argues that children are born fluent in this primal nonverbal dimension of knowing, that Children are born with varying capacities of it, but that we are all born with this dimension. She says that spiritual, spirituality is the language of these moments. The moments of watching a bird and a flower, watching rain pool into a puddle, of feeling the snow falling on your palm in Tucson in January, the feeling of watching a garden slug. Spirituality is the language of these moments, this transcendent experience of nourishing connection. The transcendent experience of nourishing connection. And once we grasp this, that spirituality is the transcendent experience of nourishing connection, our spiritual but not religious friends might be able to remember a time when they felt a deep connection to something outside themselves, when you felt a deep connection to something outside yourself, or a connection to something deeply within yourself. And with this clarity, some of Miller's other larger claims come into focus. She reports that the research tells her that spirituality, this two-way relationship with the transcendent, can be more protective against depression, substance misuse, and other dangerous choices than almost any other parenting or nurturing decision. She writes that the joint effect of parenting and spirituality was the most profoundly protective factor in relation to depression ever found in the clinical sciences. So nurturing a child's spirituality, encouraging them to have a two-way connection with a transcendent experience is more protective against depression than any other factor in the clinical setting. Spirituality has this protective factor because it, it assures a person that they are loved and cared for and that the inner compass, their inner arrow, their spiritual guidance points in healthy and safe directions for themselves. By learning to listen to the transcendent, children become self-directed when faced with the option to engage in harmful behavior, and they are less prone to defend to depression, even in the face of adverse childhood experiences. So if spirituality is so important and such a protective factor for children, how can we nurture and support their spiritual development? First of all, I might argue that if you're watching this and you're parenting children, you're probably already doing it. There's a good chance that you're already engaging with them in the ways that I'm going to talk about. The same intention and attention it takes to engage with this worship service is likely what you're already doing with the young people in your life. My experience and Miller's experience, Dr. Miller's experience, however, is that adults aren't confident. We don't feel our confidence when we're guiding young people. Miller says, so many parents tell me that they aren't spiritual themselves or think, don't think of themselves as spiritual enough. But I ask them, she says in her clinical setting, if they love their child and the answer is a passionate yes. So don't worry. 
Pure, selfless, and unconditional love goes a long way. In fact, strong and healthy parental love can fill in much of the spiritual development need. Unconditional love is spiritual parenting. Beyond unconditional love, how do we know if we're doing spirituality? For me, some watchwords are things like wonder, awe, curiosity, connection, love. Anytime we engage with our child in a thing that they're passionate about, we are nurturing their inner compass. We are saying the direction that you want to go is a good and valuable and important direction, and I am here to support you in that. Think about how that translates. If you know that you're being supported and loved the direction that you're going, you're going to continue, and you're going to continue to listen deeply for that voice within yourself. Not only that, but these are words that we can experience, we can associate with spiritual experiences and nurturing these feelings by stopping to observe the leaf floating to the ground, meditating or praying together, walking quietly through the sorrows, sharing small and large gratitudes together, or even lighting a chalice before a meal teaches children that their impulses to notice and to wonderment are valuable to us. One of the ways adults often sidestep the discomfort of not knowing whether we're doing it right, not knowing whether we're nurturing our children in a way that's protective for them, is to answer questions that they have with, I don't know. And we stop there. Yes, obviously we don't know. There are so many things we don't know, and it is important to tell our children we don't know. However, that statement of I don't know often has the unintended consequence of stifling conversation, of saying I don't know and we're not talking about this. And that's exactly what Miller says we shouldn't be doing. It doesn't matter if we know the answers. We should be having the conversations. Spirituality is a muscle that we must use or we lose. Adults can protect and tend to the spiritual lives of children and youth in our lives by developing our own spiritual values. Quote, attending to our lives with intention, cultivating our own capacity for contemplation and quiet. We welcome nature and model using the words that we want our kids to use, a thing that we know and so often do instinctively. Instead of just saying, oh, we're going to walk through the park and look at the ducks, we can talk about the loving ducks who are taking care of the ducklings. And we can talk about the good earth when we go out to tend our gardens. We can identify spiritual qualities in the people that we know or those who we encounter. So instead of saying the clerk, Katie, we can become the kindly woman with the sparkling eyes. Language sets the tone for spiritual perception. We can't see, we can't identify what we can't name. When we speak this way with our children, they come to experience the world and this relationship in the ways that we do. Now here's the real magic for me and for you use contemplating returning to our life in community together. One does not need to be a biological parent to have this influence on a child. One does not need to be a biological parent or even living in a household with a child or even in a parenting role with a child. We all have a role to play in nurturing the spiritual development of our children. A parent, grandparent, or other spiritually engaged loving adult, says Dr. Miller, is equally capable of transmitting spirituality to a child The intergenerational transmission of spirituality is passed through practice. Whether personal prayer, religious observance, or other spiritual practice, an ongoing shared awareness of the spiritual presence in the world. The Search Institute affirms the importance of non-related adults' roles in supporting young people's development. The Developmental Assets Framework identifies 40 positive supports and strengths that young people need to succeed, including, quote, receiving support from three or more non-parent adults. Three or more non-parent adults. 
These relationships, quote, are the roots of young people's success. They are essential for all young people in every community. When young people experience these relationships in families, in schools, programs, and communities, they are more likely to be resilient in the face of challenges and grow up thriving. Dr. Miller describes this as the field of love, a place to learn spirituality in your daily life. Filled with extended family, close friends, psychologists, youth workers and clergy, coaches and educators, the field of love provides a blanket of protection around child as they learn their own spiritual compass. What more could we ask for for our children than that they have a strong moral compass, that they have agency over their lives, and that they contribute to the world? However, the reality is that today many of our children have not seen a non-related adult in over a year. Our grandparents, church grandparents, aunties and uncles, the adults that we parents rely on to help us create the field of love for our children have not been able to be physically present. We can imagine the toll this reality has taken on both the young in our lives and our elders. How will we grieve the losses we've suffered in our relationships and our fields of love over this last year? How can we transform the grief of this year into a promise to each other to be present and engaged when we're back in person? Will we promise to teach each other that we have wings and we can fly? Once upon a time, there was a town where only ducks lived. Only ducks. Every Sunday, the ducks would waddle out of their houses and waddle down Main Street to their church. They would waddle into the sanctuary and squat in their proper pews. They all had their own pews, of course. The duck choir would then waddle to the front and take its place, and the duck minister would come forward and open the duck holy book. Ducks, too, seem to have their own special version of holy texts. The minister reads to them, Ducks! You have wings. With wings you can fly. With wings you can mount up and soar like eagles. No walls can confine you. No fences hold you. You have wings. You have been given wings and you can fly like birds. All the ducks would shout, Amen, and they would waddle home. As Rumi reminds us, you are born with potential. You are born with goodness and trust. You are born with ideals and dreams. You are born with greatness. You are born with wings. You are not meant for crawling, so don't. You have wings. You learn to use them and fly. So friends, when we're back together in person, will we promise to teach each other that we have wings and that we can fly? seek the spirit of a child, a child who meets life naturally, the child who sings the world alive and greets the morning sun with glee. Children are real beyond a lot. May I see seek the freedom of a child, a child who loves instinctively, who lights our day with just a smile, and shines that light on all we see. Children are real beyond all fears. May I see hopes a gift to our tears. Seek the wonder of a child, a child who sees delightfully No clouds in cloud, no golden sun, imaginations true and free Children are real beyond all lies May I see faiths a gift to our eyes
the wooden bowl. Once upon a time, there was an old woman, and as the years took their toll, she went to live with her oldest child and their spouse. The old woman tried to help as best as she could around their farm, feeding the chickens and tending to the garden. But her back was bent and sore, and her hands often trembled with easy work. Soon, the family had a new baby, and the old woman was overjoyed at being with the family. From birth, the grandmother told stories and sang songs. She taught them to recognize wildflowers and birds and taught them how to make a kite. The child loved this grandmother and the old woman loved the child. As the, month, as the months went on, the old woman's hands trembled more and more and she began to spill food onto the tablecloth and sometimes it even fell from her mouth. The old woman's child and spouse were disgusted so soon she was eating alone at a small table away from the family, away from her beloved grandchild. One day her trembling hands fell and she dropped the clay bowl that she ate her meals from and it shattered all over the floor. The grandmother's children yelled at her and were so upset that they gave their mother the old wooden bowl that once held the seeds that the old woman used to feed the chickens. The old woman sighed and said nothing, accepting her fate with resignation. One day, the adults watched their young child take a piece of wood from the wood pile. The child took out the little knife, handed down through generations, and very carefully began to work on the wood, carving and shaping it very slowly, as only a child can. The parents sat near and asked what they were making with the wood. I'm making a wooden bowl, so when you are old and your hands tremble like your grandmother's, you'll have something to eat out of at mealtime. The parents looked at each other with tears in their eyes, tears of shame. They had brought the old grandmother back to their table, where she ate with the family the rest of her days. And if she spilled a bit of food, they smiled at her and gave it no thought, no thought at all. Show me, come. 
The original title of this service was The Intergenerational Transmission of Spirituality, but that was way too long to fit on the title slide. And as we wrap up our time today, I want to reflect a little more on the fact that our children and youth and younger adults often teach us as much, if not more, about the ways in which and the reasons why it is so important to know and to follow our own inner arrow. My children, the one that I live at home with and have spent so very much time with over this last year, as well as my spiritual children, the ones who I used to see in church every Sunday and miss dearly, remind me to slow down, to pay attention, and who encourage spiritual growth in a free and responsible search for truth and meaning and the right of conscience which sounds an awful lot like the covenant that we as Unitarian Universalists affirm and promote together as a faith. We have built into this faith the realization that each of us has a different truth and that the ability to act upon our own truths is the highest expression of human good. But we already knew this. We knew that we would need to lean on our faith when the going gets tough to lead us through difficult times in a direction that aligns with our individual arrows, but one that also promotes world community with peace, liberty, and justice, and respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. Never has it been more true than now. We extinguished this flame but the sparks within us remain alight. From each of us and our supposed solitude, the signals buzz and hum, sparkling through space to one another, connecting us invisibly but palpably. We are one, and from every window our light shines. <laughs>